Good morning, everyone. Joining you today is uh, William Metzinger and Emily Reefsnyder. We are the hosts of this year's Into the Dark Room podcast, where we bring guests onto our show and inside and outside the photography program. We interview our guests and try and get an outlook on what it's like outside of the school curriculum. Joining us this morning is Darren Mickey, chair of the Creative Practices Program of ICP. He's a New York-based photographer. He is the author of Death Takes a Holiday, JNL Books, and Stuff I Gotta Remember Not to Forget. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, of course. Good to be here. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. So I guess we'll roll right into the questions. Oh. The first mm -hmm. one we have, when did you know you wanted to focus your career on photography, and what was your career path like going from being an aspiring photographer to having your work displayed in numerous publications? Well, it was long and it's not like i just woke up one day and was like oh this is what my calling is and and like most artists i was exposed to art that intrigued me at an early age i had a pivotal high school teacher named sally jones at where i grew up in kansas city she sort of opened my mind up to to different kinds of work she was showing stuff that seemed revolutionary at the time and, and still is i mean dn arbus and bill burke and and different kinds of and and also painters and, and sculptors, Jasper Johns, and, and all that stuff that was really probably inspiring to her in her time and passing it on. So this, this lineage, but I was interested in pictures and photography sort of really captivated me and, and piqued my curiosity. And also I liked the, the discovery of it. I loved being in the dark room. And when I started photography, there was, there was no such thing as digital photography. It was just photography. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't analog photography, it was just that. And so that, that magic was everything. You know, then I had to figure out something I wanted to do. And basically, I, I you know, was, seemed all right at it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> not great. It was something that I, you could also make mistakes in and learn from those mistakes. Sometimes be really well rewarded for those mistakes. You might have a, a certain intention in something, it doesn't work out, but then it leads you somewhere else. And that that really grabbed me. And then. I wanted to get out of Kansas. <laughs> I said uh, after I would go back, but at the time I wanted to get out of there <laughs> and I wanted to move to a, to another city. I was able to go to school. I was fortunate enough to get a, a scholarship that would allow me to go to a uh, school and, and then I moved to, to New York, but what, I wasn't a, a really great student or anything. And I didn't really think about career until later, until actually I got out of college. And then I was like, wait, I have to really make a living. I can't make a living in this city on minimum wage working at a record store, which is what I was doing through college. So I I really had to take it I had to get serious more after school and that's where I really pointed things and and thought how can I use this skill that I have not just to express myself but also to to help support myself and and support my art. That's it it evolved. It took and even still in in my early 20s, when I first started to do uh, shoot for, for magazines, first got pictures in the New York Times and the Washington Post and things like that, I wasn't, it just sort of happened in a way. I mean, I, I did take initiatives. I did show my work to editors and things. It was, it was a slow, I still think my, my, I don't know what my career is now. It's always changing. <laughs> so yeah, I guess that's a, a rambling way to answer that. Yeah. Did New York intimidate you at all compared to, to Kansas? No, I loved it here. I loved it. And it, before my family moved to, to Kansas City, we lived in upstate New York. My dad, father, when he was still working, was a, a salesman and he had several different jobs. And so when I was you know, still around 10 years old, when we lived upstate in Binghamton, New York, we would take trips to the city maybe once a year. And I was just blown away, you know, and that was, that was the early 80s, like, and it was fascinating. Yeah, intimidating, but but lots of energy uh, in a healthy way. It seems like yeah, yes, definitely, definitely, definitely. And it was always it was just like you couldn't figure it out. It was it was never bored, never bored. I haven't you know lived here almost I don't know twenty seven years, and I the one thing I'm not I've never been here is bored. <laughs> it's more of a thing like oh I'm not taking advantage of the things that are here all the time. But that's, that's it's sort of the opposite of boredom. Um, yeah. You had mentioned the evolution of your photography. Mm -hmm. uh, did you notice any specific changes in the content 
of your images after graduating from the School of Visual Arts? Yeah, definitely, definitely. The, the work I made when I was a student uh, of photography, I'm still a student of photography. I think every artist is a student of their medium for their whole lives. But when I was a student, I was, you know, in the first few years of, of school, I was very much emulating the, the work of, of artists that were inspired to me. I was very interested in very documentary based ph photography then, uh, Eugene Richards and, you know, the classics, you know, again, Arbus, Eugene Smith, countless other people. And then I discovered William Eggleston book of, of his photography in, in the library. It's a, again, no internet really. We didn't look at images on the internet and I didn't even have an internet. And it was, and there wasn't even at the school of visual arts, there wasn't a really good photo book section in the library for an art school. It was at that time, I don't know what it's like now, but it was, you know, <laughs> like, 20 titles. Uh, and they had a copy of William Eggleston's Democratic Forest. And I remember looking at that book because I was getting interested in color photography, sort of being really puzzled by those pictures. Like they weren't exciting pictures, really. They weren't, you know, it wasn't like a Cartier-Bresson people, decisive moments, people flying over puddles and stuff. It was really quiet pictures. And they, at first I didn't, I didn't get it, but that actually attracted me to it. That's where a shift in the work for me started to happen. Late as a, a student, I, I started taking pictures still in a documentary mode of, of bars in the daytime. I, I started this project where I was photographing in uh, local bars in, in New York, in the city, in NYC, in, in Brooklyn, and Queens from 10 a.m. To, to 2 p.m. on weekdays. So it's kind of an odd time to be there. I called the work steady days and it was sort of the day shift. And that was work that was the first work where I started to feel like, okay, I'm starting to figure something out and really structure something together. But even after school sort of floundered for a bit, I tried to emulate that work again. I went on bus trip through the US and photographed at bus stations. Great. But then it started to, I was changing. My, my ideas were changing. So after school, it was really, I didn't really start to find really what I felt was more close to my voice as an author, maybe, until maybe five, six years after school. Um, so yeah. <laughs> and I'm still looking. I'm still, it's still changing. Hopefully it keeps that way. Hopefully I don't settle in too much. Have you ever felt during your photographic journey, have you ever felt a phase where you find it hard to be looking? I know with a lot of creators at the college, sometimes we can hit a little bit of a photographer's block and have trouble. Have you hit that at all? All the, t all the time. Not all the time, but, but often, yeah. And it goes in waves. For me, I'm not just a photographer. I mean, parallel to photography has always been music for me. I'm a, a guitar player and I've played in bands for, for many years. So those things really work together. And one, th you know, if, if I'm blocked in one thing or unmotivated, I think is, is one thing, then I'll, I'll try and shift into other uh, gears. But also sometimes it's important for me to, then if I'm having trouble really working through something and really making work, then it's, I, I go into sort of a study mode and we'll be doing more research and, and reading and, and, and living. And I'm getting into cooking too, and that's inspiring because of COVID. It's, it's definitely something, but I do, I, always, I tell students and I tell myself this, that it's, it's called making work for a reason. Like it's, it is work to make it and you have to force yourself to do things. So sometimes I'll make things or I'll, I'll go out and photograph uh, when I really don't feel like it. <laughs> I really don't feel like it. And if I don't feel like it, that usually means, you know, something's not going on great. And I'm sort of, you know, I need that. And then you have to force yourself. I force myself into it. And I'll go out with the camera. Sometimes I'll go out with the camera when, when it's not even an inspiring, like the light's not even good and see what, what happens there. So, yeah, all the time. I have a lot of things going at the same time, a lot of different projects or, or bodies of work that sort of advance at different levels. So, mm -hmm. and those things, and sometimes, and this was something that I started doing later, maybe about 15 years ago. I also started just reminding myself to take photographs of things, even if they didn't fit into a specific body of work that was evolving, just take photographs of things that I was interested in and also give myself challenges. 
So what drew you to the International Center of Photography and how did you initially get started there? Uh, it's chance in some ways. I mean, this is called Into the Dark Room, which I really like. <laughs> Into the darkness. But when I was a student, I had a, <coughs> at School of Visual Arts, I had a, an excellent teacher and guide in many ways named Jerry Vizuso. And he was a color, analog color printer. And I started assisting him in my last year of, of school. And then after that, and I, I got to be pretty okay in the color dark room. And that was when everybody still, again, before digital, when everybody used the dark room. So that was a way that I supported myself. That was an extra skill when I was starting to get into shooting editorial work for magazines, still working on my own personal work, and then uh, I, I wasn't still able to support myself just through editorial work. And one way I, I started really making a living at, was through part of the skill of photography was through printing for other people, you know, doing fine art, big, large analog C prints. That's what I had a skill. And, and you know, there was a handful of color printers in, in New York at the time. They needed a color darkroom teacher at, at the uh, ICP. Jerry, who was my mentor, recommended me and I went for an interview there. That was when ICP was still in uptown Manhattan on 94th Street. And then that was right. And I started teaching there in 2001, actually like a month after September 11th. That was it. So I would I started teaching there and I'd only teach one class a term, just a darkroom class, a technical class for, for several years. And I was that was getting to know that community, getting to know people through uh, the International Center of Photography and it's a wonderful place. And then eventually starting to teach a few more classes there, teaching a seminar class and then proposing other classes that were more related to my personal work or ideas in photography. So it was, it's been a gradual sort of evolution. I've been there, you know, nearing now 20 years. As you're now the chair of the Creative Practices Program at the International Center of Photography, has your involvement in teaching played a role in your art making at all? Uh, it always has. And again, it, it's, it's evolved. Been the, in the position of the chair of the program for a little over three years now. But, but well before that, and it wasn't like I was always aware of how it influenced my photography, but when I did become aware of it, it's, it's this thing of, you know, you are... As an educator, you have an immense amount of responsibility. Uh, you, you have people who are you know, looking to you for guidance and that's important. And you have to think outside of your own shell. You have to think outside of your own sort of, outside of your own work too. It's not just how you see the world, it's imagining and trying to get into the heads of how other people might see the world. So that's been very important. It's opened me up to, to taking other chances. I have to sort of practice what I preach sometimes. And I have to remind myself of that a lot. If I'm telling students to don't worry too much about it being perfect right at the, at the beginning, don't worry about that. Don't, you know, don't get too many steps ahead of yourself. Work, work in the moment, see what the, the, the process is showing you, what the images you're, you're, you're making are starting to inform to you instead of, you know, predicting it, trying to predict it all before you've even started making the work. So that's that stuff I have to remind myself all the all the time. So moving to New York in the '80s and then starting to teach right in the early yeah. 2000s, and now yeah. we're in 2020. What is it like to see the development of New York as an artist and as a resident? Well, yeah. Well, I moved to New York in the early '90s. Early right? '90s. When I was a kid, yeah, it. when I was a kid, we we my family took some trips here, but I, I moved here in '93. But yeah, it's it's. I mean, New York's a fascinating city. It's not the only city in the world, <laughs> for sure. And and many New Yorkers, sometimes in New York, you can start to think that. It's it's definitely not. And I've also, the thing that's interesting is as long as I've lived here now, I don't necessarily consider myself a New Yorker. I'm still like, you know, I don't even know what that is. There's like many different types of New Yorkers, I guess you would say, just like anywhere. You can be from anywhere and... Not everybody's the same, but then they all ha still have a, a, a connection to where they live. I mean, I love it here. I lived for many years in Brooklyn, and then in the last three years, I, I live in, the, in an outer section of, of the city, like a no northern part of the Bronx, uh, right above the upper tip of Manhattan on 231st Street. 
And it's a different experience here. So I'm learning different things about, about this part of the city. Topography is different. Uh, there's a lot of rock outcroppings and ge geological forms uh, in this part of the city that people don't really think about that much. And that's fascinating. There's, you know, the city's amazing in different layers. A really important book to me was uh, Luke Sant's Slow Life. And it's a his it's sort of an unofficial history of, of New York or, or a, a different history of New York. And I'm, I'm fascinated by the layers here. So, but how the city changes, you know, it's evolving all the time. There's things that make me sad, make me nostalgic about other times. And there's also things that are really beautiful about it always. It's a an immense place of contradictions. <laughs> so yeah. I totally believe that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. As New York is such like a heavily populated area, mm -hmm. has living there during like the whole COVID-19 crisis affected you or your work? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's affected every my work, especially. I'm at work, you know, after I get off of this call with you all, I'm not going to get out and go on the subway and go to work. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to go to my kitchen, get an, an, another cup of coffee, and then I'm going to go to work in my living room. You know, like like so many people, you know, it's not like I work from home. My work moved into my home. <laughs> so, you know, my students come into my living room, which is, you know, via Zoom, but it it definitely has. And it was really, you know, for for so many people, it was it was across the the globe. It was very very intense and it has been and i think we're we're still reeling uh, all of us are, are still reeling and trying to figure out this thing that's you know very new and very uncharted territory it, it we, are, we are we're adapting uh in many ways it was hard to make i at the beginning of of covid at the beginning of lockdown the i couldn't really think about making work it was very hard to do that it just didn't seem to make sense but then as, a, as an educator, as somebody, I had to be a part of helping people get through this stuff in the way that I could, which was, all right, we've got to, finding that balance of not pushing too hard, being, you know, hearing a lot of people going through really intense stuff and a lot of uncertainties, but still like, all right, we have to hold on to this thing that we do have some control over. Which is which is our work and making art is interesting in that way because you do have it is a very self directed discipline it's an artist discipline and I think the word discipline is very important in that it takes discipline but it's a different dis discipline than say maybe a, an architect well maybe you know than say somebody who's a, a business uh, person's discipline or something like that. even though you have elements of that but you also have to deal a lot with uncertainty and embrace uncertainty. So it's been a ride and it still is. Uh, I think the, the last few months I've, I've personally started making more work and being able to, you know, photograph and, and get back into uh, my studio space and, and print and, and do some things like that. So, and, and work on, you know, book projects that I've been uh, working on that kind of took a sideline for a little bit. So, yeah, it's, it's a process, you know, and, and we're still, you know, where we are now, we don't know where things are going to go. So we'll see <laughs> going ahead. That's a perfect segue. So mm -hmm. with your uh, timeline as an artist, how did you mm -hmm. become involved with bookmaking? Uh, book, I mean, as a photographer, I mean, as many photographers, like photo books are the sort of ultimate way to to share your work i always really liked the like again I, I talked earlier about how i discovered that william eggleston book in a library and it was already an old book it you know had a little bit of dust on it and you know that thing that it you make something and then it lives and it has a life of its own but also books are are I love photo books, especially ones that aren't too expensive. You can buy if you're on a budget, you can, you know, get it used, whatever. But this thing that you can have and you can look at, you don't have to live in a certain city that has a gallery show. You don't have to, you know, be fortunate enough to be alive when that work was shown at, at the Metropolitan in 1970, whatever, you know, so it, it lives and it's, it's timeless. And yeah, I think it's, 
it's an interesting way. And it's also, there's other challenges in it. Fascinated in how edits and sequences can really tell a story and it changes you know, the importance of just the singular picture, but how pictures communicate together, how they string together and, and tell a story. And it's fascinating. There's so many different ways of approaching books. So the books that I've made, they've also been, they've been very much collaborations, similar to when I'm making music or playing in a, in a band or making a record. It's a collaboration. You know, you you work with, you learn a lot about your work, I have, by working with, with good editors, specifically the two books that you mentioned, Death Takes a Holiday and, and Stuff I Gotta Remember Not to Forget, besides having long titles. <laughs> they're both also published by j &L Books. Jason Fulford, who's, who, who runs that imprint, uh, along with Leanne Shapton. Jason, and I've gotten to be friends with him through that process. And I learned a lot from him and his, his, his skills as an editor. I mean, he's had a lot to do with, with those two books and, and their pace. And even when I, I don't look at them that much, I'm like, like, oh, let me take my book off the shelf. But when I do pick one, one of those books up and just look through it, I'll, 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 I'll discover something in that edit or where there's a, a, you know, a dip, a, a spread or something. And I'll be like, oh, wait, I didn't even make that connection or I'm seeing a different layer in that connection. So that's fascinating. Collaboration is really important. And also, you know, trusting others, working with people who have different skill sets. And as a, a color printer for many years, an analog, you know, darkroom printer, I was also fascinated the first time I went on press for the printing of a book, because that was just like, wow. And the first book that I went on press for, it was printed in Seoul, South Korea. So I like flew to Seoul yeah. and press operators. It was a totally different deal. And the, the book was printed in two different times and two different press operators in that, that same run. How those two individuals sort of like how the communication was with them. And, you know, there was a translator. They, I, don't, I don't speak Korean and they didn't speak English. And that was a fascinating uh, experience. So books are very interesting. There's a lot of work that goes into them. I love them. <laughs> it's, it's really rewarding. More so than, I'd say more so than, I, I, you know, if I have my pictures on a wall in an exhibition or something, that's a different way of presenting them and a different way of thinking about them. And it's very interesting to think about that, how, you know, think about scale in a different way and size. Ultimately, the, the book is, for me now, it's at this moment, it's still the, the thing, the ultimate platform for the, the work that I'm making. A specific body of work. Mm -hmm. uh, what inspired you to start your series, Death Takes a Holiday? And did you notice any key differences between all the different record shops you visited in different states? Yeah, I mean, that was, that was really, I didn't, when I started taking those pictures, it was sort of, again, like I said, like something like, well, why don't I just do this? I Obviously, I'm a big music fan. I have a, a serious sort of record collector, collector problem. <laughs> you know, I, I'm like, you know, for years since I was 10 years old, I've been buying records and it's it's been a burden every time I move. I have to move a lot of heavy albums, so I don't want to move very much. You know, it's places I'd always love to go. I'd love to go to these older shops that weren't categorized very well and, uh, you know, that were community. And it was sort of like, you know, I think when I was uh, uh a student, I was photographing in these bars in, in the daytime, and those places were community too. They weren't maybe the most positive communities sometimes, or the, the most health, healthy communities uh, on some levels, but they were communities. People, you know, would get together and you know see each other. And, and a lot of record shops, as, you know, even as a as a teenager, like the local record store, that was a place I would go, like you know, all the time, learn about different things. It was basically, they were like my art museum and my library and also an interesting place to, to watch people and, you know, very different kinds of people. Some people who were really interesting and some people who were really sort of functioning and on weird levels, fascinating places. So I always loved going there. They were always very interesting places to me. And I'm talking the older shops, the shops that have been around since the 50s, 60s, 70s that are sort of dying off. And that was the impetus. There was a place in Brooklyn. I don't know if it's still there. I have to check. I, I, probably not since COVID, but a place on Fifth Avenue in Park Slope in Brooklyn called Fifth Avenue Records and Tapes. And an old guy ran it dusty and everything's falling in on itself. 
and I went in there and I've been going in there, you know, every once in a while for years. And he's like, I'm going to close the shop. The landlord wants to get out of here. And it's, this is all going to go. And I was like, this is a fascinating place. Visually, it was a fascinating place. And I was like, well, you know, do you mind if I come back with, if I bring my camera back here and just take some pictures of things? He's like, yeah, sure. So I photographed and then, you know, it was just, I was just making a record of it for myself, making a record of a record store for myself. And then I got the pic, I, you know, it's, I shot the pictures and I looked back at them. It was digital. And I'm looking through the files. And I'm like, oh, maybe there's something here. And they were difficult pictures for you to make because it's hard to make pictures. There's nothing, there's not a lot happening that inspired me. It was, a, it was a challenge. It was also an excuse. I wanted to do something very pleasurable. It would give me an excuse to go to a bunch of record shops that I wanted to go to anyways, <laughs> take pictures, and then I would, you know, I'd look through stuff. I'd buy records. So it was it was completely selfish endeavor. Uh, and I wanted it to be pleasurable. I'd been, that's something too. I'd talk to my students around that time. I'd be like, do something that makes you happy. It made me happy. <laughs> so that's why I did it. And I, I shot that. That work was really condensed. I took those pictures over a little over a year and a half. And it'd be like, okay, I have, I'm going to drive to Johnstown, Pennsylvania and, and go to George's Song Shop, which is the oldest continually running uh, record shop in, in the country. Uh, you know, it started in like the 20s, I think, or the teens. And they were selling Edison sil cylinders before there was even records. And I get to go to that place. I get to meet the person who's running it, who's like this grandson of the original owner. And, and then p different people would come in. And I'd also go there a lot of times to places during the weekdays, similar to, to those pictures I was taking in bars. And I was interested in the people. And it was also seeing myself, but also being sort of an outsider too. So it was, just, it was fun. <laughs> and, you know, so that's, that's how that went. But that was very condensed. And it was like, okay, after a while, a few places, the pictures started to get repetitive. I was like, well, this is kind of done, you know? And it, that was a, a body of work that was very clear when it was when it was over. And the, uh, your question about the differences between places, I think what wasn't different is what attracted me to them. Again, that sense of community. They're businesses, but not businesses that are run for the sake of making a lot of money. So there was actually very, I guess, analogous to being an artist too. You'd you make art because you love what you do. You have to still support yourself. You have to keep the lights on and you have to keep fed and you have to, you want to have a certain amount of freedom to make the work. You know, you need to have a certain amount of stability to, to be able to make the work. But your reason for doing it is not just monetary. And that was similar to these places that, that I think was great. The community too, people would come in talk and maybe buy something and yeah <laughs> so sometimes with uh us photographers at school just as hard as making the work can be titles <laughs> so with us getting overwhelmed trying to decide how to title pieces and bodies of work you on the other hand have work like stuff i gotta remember not to forget is pulled from a Ziggy bulletin board while death takes a holiday, references anxiety, youth, and keeping the Grim Reaper at bay. Mm. How do you find that you generally go about coming up with and deciding on the titles for your pieces? Yeah, I mean, for, for work, the title comes later and it, it comes through the work. It's The pictures show me the titles and, the, and especially in those two cases and stuff I got to remember not to forget. That was all work I was making back in Kansas, taking trips back there and photographing Primarily, my father was still working as a salesman. He worked as a salesman in a cave. He sold storage space in caves and mines. But I was also photographing home. I was photographing the home where I grew up, and I was photographing those things. And there was a, I took a picture of, a, of that bulletin board in my parents' house. And it was like, had a list of things to do. And it's at, on the corner, it's like, it's a cartoon bulletin board. It's like Ziggy cartoon character. And it's stuff I got to remember not to forget. And it wasn't until I was working on the book and editing it, and in the editing stage, again, with, with, the, with the publisher, and we were, you know, the original title for that, the working title was Caveman, which was a terrible title, completely obvious and kind of ridiculous. And thankfully, it didn't 
become the title. And we're looking at it, and I forget which one of us, or I, th I feel like it was much more simultaneous. That's the title, stuff I got to remember not to forget. Because titles, I like titles that, that they, they connect to the work, but not in a very obvious way. And they might have a multiplicity of connections for the, the reader in a sense. So and stuff I got to remember not to forget is like very much a part of that work for me was me going back and seeing my father in a different light as myself as a, as a somebody becoming more of an adult, having a different respect for, for him, but also seeing that and saying, I don't want to forget that. Uh, I don't want to forget where I come from, but I also want, don't want to forget the things that I want to learn from that and that I want to do different in my life. So that's those things. And then it's also, it connects with photography. Like we take photography, photography's tool of, of like helping us hold on to memories, it's things I want to remember that I don't, for, don't want to forget, you know, that's, that's the nature of photographs or such an important function of photographs. So the title just clicked. And then also that it had, it was important too, like the way that people speak. Gotta is not proper English whatsoever. Stuff I gotta, but it's very, it was very much fit the Midwestern mm -hmm. vernacular <laughs> of speaking. Yeah. And then Death Takes a Holiday. That was also a thing too. That came through a picture. A picture I took of the, the proprietor of that first shop I was telling you about, Fifth Avenue Records and Tape. A picture that didn't end up in the book because it, didn't work. It wasn't a very good photograph. He was holding a VHS tape of a film called Death Takes a Holiday. Death Takes a Holiday was originally a play, I think written in the 20s. And then there was a, or maybe a little bit before that, but then there was a film, a, a Hollywood production film, black and white studio picture in the 1920, late 20s or early 30s called Death Takes a Holiday. And it's like, very literal, like death comes to earth and falls in love. And it's kind of hokey. So that thing I saw it, and I was like, death takes a holiday. This is a great title. And again, it connected to those things. And then in writing the uh, sort of, I guess you'd say artist statement or the blurb for the book, the copy for the book, uh, it was really about, again, those things like what con connected me to those places? Like what, what are some of the things obsessive collectors or people who are into records or anything, collecting anything, coins or, you know, or, or like collecting money, like, like getting into building riches and all those things. People, I think, get one of the reasons why people get obsessed about that and they want to find certain things, gyms or whatever that you want to find. And you have this list, you know, a lot of record collectors or whatever collectors will have this thing, those, those things that I need to find, you know, and then you find it and you're like, ah, oh, there's this exhilaration and it's short lived. You forget about all the anxiety, you know, when you're doing something you really love, you're making art, you're in a conversation with something or whatever, those anxieties go away. So death takes a holiday, mm -hmm. you know, Grim Reapers at bay. I'm not going to worry about that stuff. I'm in the moment. And it's short lived. You know, those are those are the things. So it had that element about it. And then also the connection to the macabre and, and, and death in, in music and rock music, especially. It's always great titles, you know, you know, I love Black Sabbath and all, all of that kind of stuff too. And it also that title functioned well. I love that it still came from a photograph. It was, again, not until like really organizing the pictures and thinking about them as a group in a book that I, you know, was like, oh, the this is the title. And it once it hit, it hit. It was like, that makes sense. So I pull my titles from other things. I mean, but writers do that all the time. And Death Take a, Takes a Holiday, it also reminded me of two great titles. There's a, a book by the uh, French author, uh, Louise Ferdinand Celine called Death on the Installment Plan which is an excellent book. And I always love that title, Death on the Installment Plan. It was like really dark, like, whoa, like that's life. Life is death on the installment plan. We're just waiting to die is very like, ooh. And then one of my favorite, the punk bands that I, I loved when I was uh, growing up, I still like them too. They're really kind of interesting and puzzling bands was the Dead Kennedys. And they had a song called Holiday in Cambodia, like a crazy, like, you know, very politically charged song. So <laughs> Death Takes a Holiday. Death on the installment plan, holiday in Cambodia, boom, perfect. I was like, those are two titles I love. And this title sort of works in there. So yeah, there's work, a working title I have for a bunch of pictures I've been taking in Japan uh, when I could still travel there. Mm -hmm. My partner, is she's, she's Japanese. We've been 
uh, married for 14 <laughs> years. So I go back when I go back to Japan and photograph there, like working title for that is is a different kind of tension. I'm an outsider there. There are certain structures to that place for me, specifically Tokyo, that are like, wow, it's really orderly in some ways. But there's, you know, to me, there's a different kind of tension, you know, and that's so that's the the sort of working title for that that work. And uh, there's a small book that I've put out of of those pictures with through a, a different publisher and that, yeah, different kind of tension. And hopefully who is ever picking one of those things up makes that connection, but it's not too literal, that it's still active in the brain, those things in photo. And that's the thing in photography that's sort of that I love in certain pictures is and what photography can do. You can look at it and you can see what's in there, but there's something else that you're not quite sure about and it's different connections. Along the lines of what you've been drawing inspiration from, mm -hmm. uh, are there any photographers or specific pieces of work that you've recently found to be personally impactful and find yourself to be drawing influence from? Definitely, definitely. And I, it's just like with music. Like I love finding about about a band or a songwriter from another era that I didn't know about. There's this uh, this connection. Like wow, this whole thing was going on and this had this other life. So, photography wise, photographer I'm really interested in and very much been discovering lately is Aiko Yamazawa, and she was making work I think even in the 30s and 40s, but. She made really great color work and doing really interesting still life work. I'd say collage work too in the 80s where she was making an image, have a print made of it, and then you know manipulate that print, re-photograph it. But beautiful color studies, different than something that I do, but influential. I'm really into really much more looking at artists and stuff that work sort of outside of maybe the genre or specific aspects of photography that I may be working in because I find that very exciting. So Aiko Yamazawa is one of them. I've always been a, a, a fan, not always, but for several years of uh, the architect and artist, uh, Gordon Matta Clark, who would use photography and his photographs are beautiful, but was also doing sculpture and, and other things like that. And then there's a whole list of the classics. And then also the people that I've gotten to know speaking about community, through the photo book community at, at book fairs and other other photographers so contemporary photographers uh you know um ron jude ed pinar uh i mentioned jason fulford quite a few others jinya friedland she's got a really great book it's always and that's the thing i think what what you asked about new work that's really important like really still educating myself still and that's part of teaching too like i have to i can't just I don't, it's, it's not right for me or it's lazy for me to just, you know, every, every year, same, show the same slides <laughs> over and over again, like here's, you know, but also staying connected to the, to the, what I'd say classics, you know, Arbus is always there, but there's, there's a lot of other things too. And beyond photography too, Andrew Weith, you know, painters, it's always like Andrew Weith's like a huge photographically, interesting artist to look at um just visually with teaching would you say mm -hmm. that that's your inspiration for creating new work right now or what drives you to make work uh i'd say it's part of it uh it's part of it but also teaching's challenging especially you know now i have to do a lot more administrative work too and uh and it's fascinating it's like working on curriculum and thinking about how different classes and different instructors will create an experience for a student and also different kinds of experiences for different students, that there's different uh, paths that they can take. That stuff's creative still, but it's also as working on my own work, I have to still, as, as you, you, you know, I think many, many people who teach or in, anybody who's balancing uh, things, you have to still make space for yourself. I have to make space to make my own work. I have to really make an effort to do that. And, that goes hand in hand. If I don't do that, if I'm not still making work, if I'm not still doing those things, then I'll, I'll eventually learn, run out of things to teach, <laughs> like run out of things to experiences to, to share. So yeah, they do, they do influence each other. It's an interesting mix. That responsibility though, too, again, of having people that you know, at least creatively, you're, you're, you have a certain degree of responsibility for, you have to 
keep things together, you know, that does influence the work and it also makes it challenging for the, for the work too. Is there any specific pieces of advice you try to pass on to your students that you would have found helpful when you first started photographing? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's there's several. You'd have to ask some of them. <laughs> They'd be like, well, what's it? You know, and hopefully they wouldn't, the, the more crazy things they wouldn't uh, <laughs> repeat. But what, the main thing is do something you enjoy. Like that making work doesn't have to be torture, but it is still making work. It is still like, it requires discipline, but it requires an artist's discipline. Uh, and you figure out what that discipline is for you, structure and sort of how you mo how you continue to be self-motivated. But don't take things too, too seriously. And the word career, I, I, the career thing, like it's important, it's incredibly important. And it's also like thinking back to being, you know, in my early twenties and like, what am I gonna do after I get out of this precipice into the world? Well, you're already still in the world. You know, your experiences, is stu you're, you're still a part of the world. You're in the world. It's not like you go out and you go into the world. You're in the world already. Those things from remembering to, that it also takes time. It takes a long time and to be very, some other things that I, I had to remind myself of and it, you know, don't compare your development or accomplishments too much to, to your peers, to those next to you. Because some people, you know, they'll, even while they're in school or they're out of school or they never go to school and then they, they end up making a body of work or they do something or they get a, and it's, that's great for them, you know, and keep, make that drive you more than make you feel like, uh, you know, be, have that sort of like, you know, be inspired by other people to keep making work and doing those things and, and don't, that it's, it's easy to get into the thing like, well, I don't have this thing or I don't have that thing or, and don't think too much about accomplishments by certain ages. The art world, I mean, I hope it's getting better now, but when I got out of school, it was very much about the, the young artist, like discovering the young artist, like the new young artist. And so the, you know, art worlds and, they, you know, editors, whatever, they would be like, they'd want the young, hot, you know, artist like who in some ways because they could you know pay them less or they could take advantage of them in some ways where they could get a quick sale out of that but then you know it's hard to maintain the longevity of that and there was this thing if you don't have I remember contemporaries of mine in school being like I need to have a show in whatever the Chelsea or whatever the gallery spot of the time was by this age or I'm, I'm failed and that's like ridiculous you know art is not like professional sports in that sense. It's a different timeline. I, there's nobody in the NBA who's 60. <laughs> you know, there's nobody, but there's plenty of artists who start making really interesting work when they get to 60 uh, or, or something like that, you know? Yeah, the NFL, you're not gonna be like a, there's, there's not like a 50 year old quarterback in the NFL. You know, so that's a different thing that, you know, in that sense, like you've got to get somewhere at a certain age because your your body can't do the thing. It's a it's a different connection. But as an artist, you know, you got to maintain your mind and the evolution of your mind, your thoughts in the world. That stuff's that's a long trip. I do say another thing I say to students and I, I probably heard it somewhere else. Everything I say I heard from somewhere else, just like all the titles for my work. I steal from somewhere else that, you know, being an artist is a life sentence. To life sentence, <laughs> like you just, you just never like, and you never hit that thing. Like you never, it's never good enough. Like, you know, you make, if you have a certain goal, you get a book or you get a show or you have are recognized in some sort of, I don't know, journal or something that's important. That's good, it's accomplishment. And then you still gotta keep going from there. It's not like, oh, it's done now, I'm good. <laughs> you know, so it is, it's a long journey. Uh, so keep keep your goals realistic. And also remember that being an artist and making art also requires that you live and you enjoy your life. And those things influence it just as much as when you're, say, with a camera taking pictures. It's also, again, the conversations you have with people, the relationships you have with people, the other things you enjoy that you, you know, are good to yourself. You eat good. You try and you know, feed your head too. like, you know, read books, 
that stuff. Do things you enjoy, riding a bike or, you know, you know, climbing a mountain or walking around the, the city or, or your town, uh, even if you're not taking pictures, do that stuff. <laughs> That's a beautiful way to send this off. As of right now, I guess the last thing we'll ask, where can people see your work? If right uh, I mean, you know, they can see it in books. Those books that you mentioned, you know, they're not going to go to a bookstore now, I guess. And there's no New York Art Book Fair this year, but they can, that online, it's there. You just, you know, like how most people see it. You go, My website's not really up to date, but it's got a little bit on there. I don't put too much on there. And uh, yeah, they can see it in, in there and different, yeah, Google. <laughs> <laughs> Google, Google, especially Google, great resource. I mean, you know, find a lot of people now too, but I can't discover them in a book or something. Yeah. Well, I apologize for the earlier time slot, but I appreciate you coming on out or yeah. coming on and yeah. uh, doing the Google meet with us. Thank you so much for joining us today. All right. Thank you, William. Thank you, Emily. It's been a pleasure. All right. Have a great rest of your day. You too. Bye-bye.